Hello everyone and welcome. Sit back, relax, make a cup of tea or whatever you like to drink and get ready for new stories from Yellow Cat. Send your own favorite stories in the comments below and maybe they'll be in our new video. So subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed yet and let's get started. What was the most lucrative reason someone at your place of employment was let go? Part 5. Lincoln Tech provides me with interns, often a few times a year. Before they graduate, the school requires them to work 150 hours at a job site. Our child, from about a year ago, made a good impression right away. He spoke more than one language and appeared excited about the training. He had to complete some paperwork for the school on the first day he went to work. After 20 minutes, he dozed off in his chair. Now that my tech and I are seated roughly 40 feet apart, our back and forth conversation is a little noisy. The kid remained unmoving, even though our conversation was at a normal level. Call me paranoid, but I didn't want to come into contact with him. Even if it's something as simple as trying to wake someone up, I don't need to file a lawsuit. So I gave the placement coordinator a call. It was 20 minutes from Lincoln Tech where she was driving. The child spent the entire time asleep. It was almost an hour when she got there. We attempted to talk to him about it after she woke him up. To begin with, it wasn't the first time. It seems like he had dozed off a few times during class. He claimed to be taking some kind of sleeping pill because he had trouble falling asleep. We brought up the point that he didn't appear to have any trouble falling asleep in class or on the job site, so perhaps the pills weren't the best choice. In addition, I proposed doing a sleep study, which some local hospitals are known to provide at no cost. In essence, the child turned down any advice or assistance we gave. He was driven back to Lincoln Tech by the job placement woman, and that was the last time we heard from him. He slept here for approximately an hour before leaving. How many children have left after just a few days is something that truly baffles me. We're not some strict corporate environment, rather we're a fairly loose shop. However, I can recall at least three other children who simply vanished after perhaps a few days of being here. After spending thousands of dollars and months in school, they are this close to graduating and then give up. For a few years during my time in college, I worked part-time at the nearby UPS Center where I washed, fueled, and parked trucks. All the trucks had manual transmissions and must be able to drive stick was always prominently featured in their help wanted ads. The only small van we had, called the peanut truck, was equipped with an automatic transmission. I was instructed to give the middle-aged man a tour of the facility and teach him the ropes on his first day after he applied and was hired. In the peanut truck, he interjects, So, uh, so most of these trucks are automatic, right? As we approach the gas pumps. No, this is the only automatic we have here on the lot, I replied. Are you able to operate a manual vehicle? He said, uh, okay with a sheepish expression. I understand, you go get the next one and I'll fill this one up. I caught glimpses of him speaking to the boss two minutes later, saying things like, well, I didn't think they'd all be manual, and it was in the ad! Two minutes after that, the taillights of his car were disappearing into the distance. Poor effort didn't even last five minutes. The following summer, a different man was employed for the same position of car washer, and he essentially said, Where are all these cars I'm supposed to be washing? I see nothing but these effing trucks! Well, these are the cars we're washing, I said. UPS simply still refers to their delivery trucks as package cars, which is an outdated practice. Oh, F off! I'm not gonna waste seven-something hours on a GD truck, perhaps cars, but trucks? H, no way. Where's the boss? I want to talk to him. I was hired under falsified, uh, what you call it, preteens. Two minutes later, taillights, disappearing, distance, etc. Guy spends a week receiving instructions in a classroom. Comes out and gets sat on the floor with the rest of us. He receives an introductory packet, needs to set up a few accounts, and probably needs to wait for IT to set up a few other things. 
The guy's lounging comfortably in his chair, having a great time, presumably just bored with the first day's workload. Extremely relaxed environment, so nothing to get worked up over. However, one of the leads follows him down the aisle, pauses, and peers over his shoulder. Hey man, please stop messaging people on Facebook and scrolling through it. Simply review the contents of your packet. IT should be finished with your database accounts. After five minutes, the lead returns with a cup of coffee and follows the guy back, returning to the desk via the same route. Pauses and peers past the man's shoulder. Hey, I know this is a little chatty, but you can't really be on Facebook in here. Please review the instruction pamphlet. They chose to wait for an additional five or ten minutes because the lead is now a suspect. Get up, follow the guy, and glance at his monitor, and enter the front office after passing straight through. Return with HR escort. They both follow the man, gesture, and snap photos with their phones. Then give him a shoulder tap. Yes, dude, you've been asked to stop what you're doing three times in the last 15 minutes, and you're not even trying to hide it. This isn't working. Please accept this final check, and we'll accompany you to your locker so you can get rid of it. This is the interesting part. He gets up and heads out the door, followed by the lead in HR. There's no fight in him at all, and then all of a sudden, this guy just planted his feet, he did a backflip, landed it, and exclaimed, Yeah, F you guys, before heading out. After they exit the room, leaving everyone in utter shock, one senior says, What the F was that? And everyone bursts into giggles. After 15 minutes, Lead re-enters the office, shuts the door, and yells, What the F was that? into the space. To which, there's another burst of laughter in the room. For the rest of the day, little to no work was done. Worked in education. There was a dumb, smart, casual dress code, but it was fairly loose. The new hire arrives, donning a t-shirt, hiking boots, and casual shorts. He ties his lanyard to his shorts instead of wearing it around his neck. He singled out for his attire and returns the following day wearing the same clothes. He is a complete tool, and as soon as we enter a training session, he starts lecturing the trainer about Ofsted and other things that had nothing to do with her. I don't think he knew who she was, just a nice regular woman given some training about a system. The head of the department and the other members of our team are apologizing to a nice training lady while exchanging shocked looks. When we emerge, he's dragged into a meeting. Since the conference rooms are transparent, it's clear that everyone on the team is staring. He confides in my manager that he enjoys testing the limits to see what he can get away with initially. The manager informs him that his job will be terminated. Guy says, I just moved my family from the other side of the country for this job, and breaks down in crocodile tears. When my usually kind and understanding manager tells him that he ought to have considered that before acting in that manner, the tears stop right away and we never see him again. For the next five years or so that I worked there, everyone knew that when someone mentioned tiny tears, they meant this guy. Share your horrible experiences slash story from living in an HOA condominium or with jerk neighbors part 5. In 2020, we were considering a twin house. Since many HOAs only allowed two dogs per member at the time, we had three dogs at the time. We purchased the house relieved that there was no homeowners association. A mention of an HOA was made at the closing. We were informed that the HOA never materialized and that the builder filed for bankruptcy in 2007 after completing the area. On the paper, the reference was crossed out. Two driveways off of a cul-de-sac compromised the neighborhood. Not the driveway I live on, but the other driveway that a builder intended to use as an easement for a multifamily home. Of the houses, four of us were not impacted and six were on the driveway. One owner, who was the most affected, became enraged and contacted the other owners, insisting that we must bring the long-defunct HOA back to life in early 2021. She started the process by persuading nine of the owners that this was a smart idea. We were frequently left out of votes, including those to choose board members because we were the outliers. Before long, the common areas were insured, and we were told we owed $110. Subsequently, we were informed that we needed to pay $1,500 for a legal retainer to challenge the recent event. All funds were to be deposited directly into the personal bank account of the HOA president. 
The HOA never filed taxes and no LLC was ever established. After things became ugly very quickly, we hired our own lawyers and listed our house for sale. We were informed that five others were in the works, but the vagueness of the HOA turned them all down. Interest rates had increased following yet another summer of infighting, and there were far fewer buyers in October than there had been in May. We managed to sell, but for 20 k less than we had requested. The HOA disbanded the moment we left. For the sake of conciseness, many transgressions were left out of this. We currently reside in an apartment and are in our mid-50s. We downsized and put a lot of our possessions into storage. Every year, our HOA has a chili cook-off. It's a little occasion. About 100 people come to enjoy the 20 to 30 chilies that we usually get. And just to give you some background, our suburban neighborhood is quiet, upper middle class, and home to us. We have a tennis court and a swimming pool among our gated amenities. Every summer, we employ a few local teenagers to check memberships at the gate. However, since everyone knows each other, the kids are essentially being paid a small amount of money and given some work experience. The occasional speeder who crosses our neighborhood to get between streets during rush hour is the only crime we have. Every year, our tennis court serves as the venue for the chili cook-off. For whatever reason, our HOA insists on hiring a rent-a-cop specifically for this event rather than the neighborhood teen watching the gate. There's no logic or pattern. It's actually one of our neighbor's smaller yearly events. None of the others have security. Anyhow, this clown appears wearing a Punisher patched bulletproof vest. He parks his SUV on the grass, snarling at people who enter and holding an AR. He stands in front of the gate. His SUV also bears a large Punisher badge. Then he goes around eating chili and, with his weapon in the other hand, glares at the neighbors who are serving themselves chili. We began taunting him last year for showing up to a gated community chili cook-off armed with a rifle like a rent cop And he said, You never know, so you always gotta be prepared. In a deadpan, serious tone. I suppose we should be grateful to our HOA for using our funds to keep us all safe. We'll all be shielded from armed attackers at our chili cook-off by an enraged bald man who believes he's a comic book mercenary. Why are we wasting our money on this, really? E. The State of Colorado Furthermore, in response to the Dean criticism that he cannot eat chili while brandishing a weapon, it has a sling on. Is that really all you took away from this? I discovered that the reason my next door posts about events in our HOA community were removed was because the board members were also the leads for the ND neighborhood. Local volunteers known as leads assist local police stations. They're expected to adhere to ND policies. In my instance, they were carrying out the local homeowners association board's rule that prohibits posting without board approval. Even though my posts complied with ND guidelines, they were still being removed. I objected to the support moderators. The posts were replaced by them. Again, the leads defeated them. I objected once more, and this time something transpired. It seemed that promising that ND took care of the problem when they told me that. My posts regarding California's HOA laws, CIV 4515, Freedom of Speech for Members and Residents of HOAs, was removed by someone who seemed to be a supporter of our board members, who also claimed that it didn't adhere to ND guidelines. ND guidelines state that you're not allowed to post national partisan policies or solicit donations for political offices or charities, which HOA issues obviously aren't. When I went to support once more, they immediately reposted the deleted article. Putting the HOA board in its rightful place was an amazing feeling. Nextdoor accepts HOA issues as content, and your board members' trolls and leads are unable to delete your posts. Nextdoor has thus extended a warm invitation for HOA conversations. Recall that you should ask the moderators for a more thorough review if your post is removed for a flimsy reason. Your posting ought to resume. The topic has piqued people's interest greatly. In the first three hours, my first HOA post received over 1,500 hits. Try next door if you have HOA problems. It might assist in gaining the necessary public attention for this HOA issue. 
To avoid having to speak with me, the rules end that was bothering me in my case had a habit of taping their notices to my door at 3 in the morning. I stayed up early one morning just to witness them in the act, and they were so terrified that they never returned and began mailing them. Demanding a meeting with the HOA council was the second step. The HOA council was mandated by the bylaws to meet four times a year and hold open sessions where any member could address them. In addition, any member may call a meeting to contest any notice that is given within a fortnight. And here's the catch. There was absolutely no meeting taking place. Since nobody was attending the annual meeting, they were even considering canceling it. They'd essentially cut off all communication, leading the entire neighborhood to believe they had established their fief. I began by giving them just the bare minimum of two weeks' notice that I intended to attend the upcoming quarterly meeting. The meeting was postponed two days in advance, then again and again before being canceled, which certainly sent people awry. One evening, the end called me after I sent them an email signing the bylaws and insisted that I was entitled to my meeting. I informed him that it amounted to gross negligence and mismanagement of the HOA for me, as well as others, to be fined for infractions of the rules that were minor while he shamelessly and openly broke them. That any more correspondence would be deemed harassment and would lead to a lawsuit to dissolve the HOA if the parties were unable to address the council or challenge his rulings. I also informed him that even though his position on the council gave him access to my property, if the HOA wanted to do business with me in the future, it would have to be handled by someone else. He received official notice that he was forbidden from using my property, that he had violated it, and that I would call the police if I ever saw him in person or on camera again. Since then, the only communication I've received from the HOA is an annual bill. If you want to watch the part 4, click the link here. Thank you for subscribing, likes, and comments. We're very happy to see you all in the comments too. Thanks for your support.